to do what it wants to do to protect its citizens and and um again people generally are i in my experience disproportionately supportive i've never had one person say anything negative to me i mean maybe they you know they're not going to but just so you know i've not i've never had anyone say anything negative to me about wearing it why aren't you remind, reminding people about palestinians nothing like that i've never had anything like that and i've never had anybody you know say israel is evil or like nothing but black eye i don't know i don't i don't know what you know, like I said, take it for what it's worth. I haven't had anybody give me a problem. So, uh, and like, I don't care if they do. Obviously, I'm prepared for it. That's why I'm wearing it. But I just want you to know, as people who, you know, maybe are interested about what reaction I'm getting on it, I've not had any negative reaction. Great. So I've been to Nevada. I've been to Arizona. I've been to different parts of California. I've been to Northern and Southern California from Northern California all the way down to, to uh, San Diego during this time. And in none of those places has anyone given me a hard time for it. And like I said, I mean, I don't care if they do, but they haven't. And um, I'm fully prepared to engage with somebody if they do, but I haven't had to. So I just want you to know that's the, that's hey, the story. Hey, Rabbi. Yeah, I was pretty impressed to see uh, Rappaport, Messing, and 450 entertainers. You know, it's about time they got on board. They got on the. On I plane. think it's about, I think it's about a thousand now. What John's talking about is the people in the media that have come out against Jonathan Glazer and against the comments um, about Israel that were part of the Oscars. Um, yeah, I, I think I think people have been pretty have been pretty responsive to that in Hollywood, which is good to see. And I also, I mean, like really responsive. I, I have to tell you, I mean, I started getting emails from people in the business, like the, that night. And, and I was like, well, I, I don't really know what we can do about it, but, and then I got an email today from somebody who's pretty, I think fairly, fairly liberal who said they wrote a letter to Chuck Schumer today to tell them that they we're not happy with his comments about Israel. So people are also taking that to another level of, of um, you know, saying it's not appropriate for somebody in Congress to interfere with uh, another country's elections, especially, again, one that's in the middle of a, a war. And um, right. yeah, it's kind of ironic, right? They They complain about other countries meddling in ours. Yeah. yeah, I think I think uh, a lot of people are um, very upset. And um, listen, I got to tell you, I mean, nobody asked them to comment on it. And right. well, no, listen, let me let me rephrase that. We didn't ask him to comment on it. The people in the Jewish community didn't ask him to comment on it. And uh, I that doesn't mean that people in the government didn't ask him to comment on it i think he to some extent was used by the by the white house and the people in yes. charge to, huh? uh, yes. to uh come out and to embarrass israel and i think it had it i think it had the opposite effect folks i'm telling you i haven't seen i haven't seen people say well look what chuck schumer is saying i haven't had i haven't heard that right. from so in the end i think it 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 weakened his credibility and i i just want you to know i yes. have what you say turn to me now, i will tell you like you know for people who are a little bit again who identify on the left and you know like i recently had somebody who i very much respect and who some of you know i'm not going to tell you who it was but um she said to me that she's tired of defending israel i said this is what i said i said there is no way the average Israeli soldier is going to carry out any of this brutality. That's how I know that Israel is doing its best. You know as well as I, there's no way, no way they'd be able to keep that under wraps if it was happening. Right. There would be massive protests if the military did anything resembling what the U.S. would have done or had already done. So I just want you to know that um, 
that's how you know. So when people say, and again, like, you know, this is obviously a bigger issue for people who are who are themselves more on the left. When people say, well, what do you say about that? Or what do you say about Netanyahu? What do you say about this? You say, listen, it's not about Netanyahu. It's not about the government. The average Israeli soldier would not engage in brutality of any kind. And and if, if there was any kind of brutality, it would come out and it would have been reported and the Israelis would have been offended by it. They would have they would have protested it. So just so you know, it's not possible. And that's how that's how, you know. OK, so when people say, well, how do we know? How do we know? That's how, you know. So just understand the Israeli soldiers who who are fighting are the people who they're the people who know. OK, so. Um, yeah, so when you're yeah. asking talking to people and they're you know they're saying well what up what about this what about that that's that's what you can tell them because look the israelis are are some of these soldiers are very very liberal they're very liberal and they're 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 motivated by many of the soldiers are are look the soldiers come from all backgrounds religious secular left wing right wing center whatever right every every soldiers from every part of the country the soldiers were engaged in behavior that was was in any way is problematic. It would have come out and it would have been discussed and it would have been protested. There would have been protests. There would have been there would have been massive rallies in Israel. You know, and I know it would have been on the front page of every newspaper in the world. They yeah, would, have it would have been on the front page. Blasted it. It would have been in Israel in Israeli newspapers first. Right. Just you know, the, that's some of the biggest newspapers in Israel are left wing. Mariv, Yedir Akronot, these are these are left wing newspapers. They 100% they do not like Netanyahu. If anything was coming out that would have been problematic, they would have slammed him and they would have slammed the military 100%. Understand, Israel has a very strong left wing leftist uh, part of its of its government and part of its uh, part of its citizenry. Oh. Trust me when I tell you that this would not happen. It couldn't happen without people knowing about it and then reporting it and slamming them for it. There's people who hate Netanyahu in Israel. They were protesting, and you know this, they were protesting all the way up through the, literally up through the time that this happened. That's why some people think Netanyahu let it happen. But you can't have it both ways. You can't say that Netanyahu let it happen and then these same people are now not, they're not, they're, they've now suddenly said that we're not going to, protest Netanyahu because the argument is that it's going to undermine Israel's security. It's just not true. Israel does not have a unified, no country, even countries that are supposed to have unified, uh, you know, I, you know, uh, non, you know, totalitarian governments like China, they still find ways to get this information out. Trust me when I tell you, Israel is not a totalitarian country and the stuff would come out. That's they don't live in a vacuum, but you know it's it, interesting since you since we're discussing this topic, and we're such a small group here. But don't kid yourself; I'm sure it's being talked about all over the place. Uh, I wonder why the world thinks Israel has to be held to a, a different standard in the in the battlefield tactics than any other country on the planet. That that's yeah. very yeah yeah. Um. All I say is Manish Tana Why they they always <laughs> That's right. That's right, Joyce. Again, this is this is our This is what they do. This is our burden. And you know right. what? I am I'm I I am never going to expect it to not be there, John. So I'm never gonna right. accept it. I'm never gonna expect this two this double standard, this this standard for Israel and then the rest of the world. I never expect it to go away. In the meantime, Fine, we have a higher standard, and I we talked about it yesterday in Tuesday's class. Mm -hmm. Jews have a higher standard. We have a higher standard for behavior. We have a higher standard for what we expect from ourselves, and I'm okay with that. You know what? Let's have a higher standard. I have right. no issue. I have no issue with it. I have no issue with it. But I want to tell you, that being said, there's a double standard, and then there's a ridiculous standard, and then there's again people who essentially. Are using this to, to as another way of destroying Israel, which is let's have Israel be in a situation that they simply can't defend themselves. 
And that's, to blame them with no facts, no facts. They yeah, blame. And that's, our, and that's our problem. So again, um, you know, we're, we're, you know, I'm expecting always to have this double standard. So in the meantime, as I tell you, I, I think that we really don't, we, you know, and I want to bring you the message that I think that the stand, and again, is it anecdotal? Yes. Do I have polls? No, I don't believe any poll anyway. So don't ask me to give you a poll, but there are polls on, they've polled people on their support for Israel. And again, they're exactly what you'd think they are, but I think that, I think they're not fully indicative of what's really happening, which is that most Americans are, are in full support of Israel. And uh, how do I know that? Because I know most Americans understand what's happening from the from the standpoint of most Americans, most Americans, not everyone. I don't want anyone to say I said everybody, but most Americans understand that the people that Israel is fighting against are the same people that would be fighting against the United States. Right. Who have a, a, a different set of of values and have a different set of of priorities and, quite frankly, are opposed to our way of life. And so. Just understand that most Americans get that. They do, they do get that. There is definitely groups that don't. And I, again, there's disproportionate amounts of young people and college people. And, you know, we've talked about it in universities, but again, uh -huh. not most of America. That is a small segment of America. So don't despair of it. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be fighting and we should, we should let it go unchallenged. But I'm just telling you. Don't think it's disparate. Don't take it out of proportion. Don't blow it out of proportion to what it really is. Doesn't mean we should be vigilant. Doesn't mean we shouldn't identify it and fight it. I 100% think we should fight it. But just remember, it is not the average American. Okay. So that being said, and I'm saying that is good news. The good news is, is that, again, and it's not just what I'm saying, it's what I'm talking, when I talk to other people, rabbis, other people in different parts of the country. I'm going to Nashville at the end of April. Um, I'm going to be traveling and doing some stuff in in uh, in the East Coast and in the South over the over the next several months. I mean, I'm going to see it with my own eyes. I, I want to. I know it's. I know what I'm being told, and I know what people are saying. But I want to see it with my own eyes, and I'll report it back to you. Honestly, I will tell you. Honestly, what I say, I'm not going to tell, I'm not going to sugarcoat it, but I'm going to tell you what's really happening and not what the media is reporting and not what a poll, not what you read a poll told you. You cannot believe what comes out in a poll. I'm telling you, if you don't believe that now in 2024, I don't know when you're going to believe it. Do not listen to a poll. Do not listen to somebody telling right. you that this is what the New York Times poll said or the Gallup poll said or anything. It is not it is literally worthless, okay? So just know that that is not indicative of anything. There's no data behind that. I don't trust any of those polls because I know they talk to people, but how do they select these people? How do they find these people? I have no, I, look, I believe they have to be honest with their reporting. They say, we spoke to a, you know, 2,000 people. We spoke to 1,000 people, whatever they say. I'm 100% sure of that. But if they self-select it, if the if the if the if the group that they're talking to is in any way a result of any kinds of 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 prearranged and kind of like manipulated uh and not even even intentionally manipulated but if there's any type of 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 approach to it that's not that's not giving you a, a reflective uh, response what what's it what's the value of it i can get a thousand people together and give you an answer uh, which would blow your minds on 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 anything on any direction so just trust me when i tell you do not put your put your value into these things okay i i know that you like we've been trained for generations to think that there's polls or that there's something that's going to tell you the future doesn't mean that they're always inaccurate it doesn't mean that every poll there's not going to be a poll that's right. I'm just telling you, don't believe a poll as it, that is anything other than what somebody said happened when they made calls to you don't know who they made the calls to. So um, for better or worse, for good information or not a good information. OK, so um, and again, all I can do is just go out there and and. Uh, anyways, just try to get as much information, as much 
um, as much information as we can from from the from the from the ground. But anyways, let's take a look at uh, Perkel. Right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Before we before we proceed, is there any update on the uh, the Kessler murderer? Um. Yeah, I can tell you this. Um. So the last uh the 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 um the uh the uh preliminary hearings on um in that were in last month essentially they they decided to I'll tell you what the um I'll tell you what the the uh, the trial has been moved I mean has been the trial date has been set for We'll tell you when the trial has been set for. It is set for, um, sorry, I'll tell you. It is set for, there's been no, they've not added any hate crime charges yet as of now, which means there's probably going to be no jail time. I, I'm assuming that, but that's based on, again, everything that I'm in hearing, I've been hearing. So um, here's what it is. It is the the date is I thought I put it in my calendar, but I'm I'm looking at the actual uh, discussion about this with the people involved in the trial. It is sorry, sorry. Um, it is the trial date is supposed to open. I don't want to tell you. Hold it. Um, okay, hold it. It is April 3rd. April 3rd is the next date. So that's a little less than a month. Next court date is April 3rd at 1 30. Um, it's actually coming. When it when 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 they told us it was going to be April 3rd, this meeting is being recorded. When we when we when we were told that the the court date was in April, felt like it was a long time away, but it's not actually. It was was it's not actually that. It's not actually that far in advance. So, I mean, it's only a couple of weeks away. So I don't know what's going to happen at that court date. Um, and as I said, as of today, and I doubt it's going to change in the next couple of weeks. There's no hate crime charges. So, as I said, it's probably. Not going to serve a day in jail, so I can't. I, I don't know that for sure, but I, don't know. I assume he's going to be. They're going to say something to the effect that if he does anything else, if he ever commits another felony, it'll be a third strike and it'll go away for twenty five years or whatever they'll say. But it doesn't matter. They're basically saying he he's not going to jail. So, all right. So, um. So let's take a look at uh, kind of where we've, where we've been the last uh, week. Uh, we started in chapter five with reading about numbers, different numbers of things. We started at higher numbers at tens. We moved in last week into sevens, and that's where we're picking up. So last week we read about different characteristics of, of people, wise people, and as they call them, clods, or again, the Hebrew word we read is golems, golems or wise people. Golem contrasted with a wise person. Uh, and then um, we're still in the sevens. Today we're going to be in the sevens and we're going to be in the fours uh, as we go through these uh, numeric groupings of sayings about different numbers. So it started with 10 utterances that the world was created. That's the way it started. Uh, and we had a few tens. And now we're moving into the sevens, as I said. Uh, and we'll see some interesting stuff here. This one uh, is interesting because it does talk about stuff that we've read on Tuesdays about um, prophetic, um, uh, prophetic, well, apocaly apocalyptic kinds of things um, that we definitely saw in the prophets about bad stuff that would happen. Um. But remember, this is written around the time of Christianity, the beginnings of Christianity. And so I find it interesting that the discussions about these things actually probably have a little bit, a little bit of, of a connection or a more direct connection to some of the things that we see in Christianity. So let's look at this. 
So this one is sevens, and it is seven kinds of punishment come to the world for seven categories of transgression. So what they're saying is, is there's seven kinds of punishments that we see in the world, and these come about because of certain types of transgressions. So if you make some mistake, this is the type of punishment that you get. So if you do this thing, you get this thing when it comes to punishment. So these are all not good things. This is not like a good thing and a bad thing. These are all bad things. So here they are. When some of them give tithes and others do not give tithes, a famine from drought comes, so some go hungry and others are satisfied. When they have all decided not to give tithes, a famine from tumult and drought comes. When they have, in addition, decided not to set apart the dough offering, an all-consuming famine comes. Pestilence comes into the world for sins punishable by death, according to the Torah, but which not have been referred to the court, and for neglect of the law regarding the fruits of the sabbatical year. The sword comes to the world for the delay of judgment and for the perversion of judgment, and because of those who teach the Torah not in accordance with the six accepted law. Wild beasts come to the world for swearing in vain and for the profanation of the name. Exile comes into the world for idolatry, for sexual sins and for bloodshed and for transgressing the commandment of the year of the release of the land. At four times, pestilence increases in the fourth year, in the seventh year, and the conclusion of the seventh year at the conclusion of the Feast of Tabernacles in every year. In the fourth year, on account of the tithe of the poor, which is due in the third year. In the seventh year, on account of the tithe of the poor, which is due in the sixth year. And at the conclusion of the seventh year, on account of the produce of the seventh year. And at the conclusion of the Feast of Tabernacles in every year, for robbing the gifts to the poor. So these are all, let's kind of explain this. So both of these paragraphs are about the same thing, these punishments. So these are explanations for why bad things happen to us. Specifically, the things that they're focusing on are things that happen to us as a group, as a collective whole, which they have famine, pestilence, war, wild beasts, and exile. Now, they, of course, break it down and tell you why certain things happen and why they happen at certain times of, of life and why they happen at, at uh, certain, around certain holidays or why they happen at certain cycles. And it's because of when these things happen. So a lot of it has to do with, again, people not following the Torah, for not following the laws that the Torah essentially bases everything around, which is making sure that tithes for the poor are, are being done, to make sure that the sacrifices and the offerings for the temple are done at the right time. All stuff that people would normally kind of maybe not be careful about unless they were afraid that doing so would, would have very bad consequences. So if they don't do these things, there's going to be bad things. And so these things that we see, swords, or war, pestilence, famine. These are very similar to what Christians thought of, as we know, as the four horsemen of the apocalypse, uh -huh. which are war, disease, famine, and then death, which seems like, isn't that all of them? There's death, but that's what they had is the other, is the last one, is death. So, um, those are the four horsemen. But uh, we have exile added to that list, which is interesting because, you know, for us as a people, mm -hmm. exile was, right? Exile comes to the world for idolatry, for our sexual sins, and for bloodshed, and for transgressing the commandment of the year of release, the Jubilee year. So this is interesting. So exile for us was a punishment. Um, it's not included in the in the Christian list. So we're essentially, again, they have the same things here in the, in, in our list of, of, of apocalyptic and horrific things, but in, unlike death, we have exile. So we have war, famine, pestilence, and exile. Um, it's interesting that the Christians added death 
But I think it's to some extent because what is exile for for a Christian? A Christian, a Christian exile didn't necessarily mean anything because they didn't have a land that they said, well, if we're not in this land, we can't be, you know. For us, exile was like can't be in exile. We have to be in our homeland. So it actually shows you one of the differences between Judaism and Christianity, even in the earliest days, that, again, to some extent, the problem of what, why Christianity added death to the list of the four horsemen is that, and, and by the way, this isn't the only time in this text, in Pirkei Avot, you're going to see this list of, of, of punishments. Yeah. Christians didn't, exile didn't really make sense. It, it doesn't, it doesn't, like, look, no one wants to have to leave their homes, but exile is a whole different level of, I mean, we lost sovereignty in our land. And like, how do we maintain our identity if we don't have a homeland? Now, what we did as Jews is we turned the Geulah, the exile, into a whole framework of like, this is what we're in. We're in exile. But exile presupposes, right, that you have a homeland. You can't have an exile if you don't have a homeland. Mm -hmm. Exile doesn't mean anything if there isn't a place that you got exiled from. And so the fact that we always talked about being in Galut, in the exile, means that we weren't in our homeland. So it's interesting that for us, exile was seen as one of the forms of punishment mm -hmm. and one of the things that again, maybe didn't translate very well for a Christian audience. So that they had to kind of put in death, which really doesn't make sense. Again, this list of the four, I want to say four horsemen, but um, the four apocalyptic things that happened to us, war, pestilence, famine, and exile. Uh, those pop up. We will see them in this in these precavot uh, sections in addition to other parts of the of the rabbinic writing which talk about these these things specifically again here you see that and, it, and it's wild beasts is added here too is one of the things which is interesting because um wild beasts i think is really there to some extent as a continuation of of um the 10 plagues because the, the 10 plagues are 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 um, kind of the preeminent examples of punishments. But these are, again, all lined up towards specific things. So here it's not just, you know, in, in some cases, again, you can see that famine is, is, there's a few versions of famine before we even get to the sword. So you have like famine comes because of tithes, because of uh, not setting aside the dough offering, uh and uh you know um you have the sword the wild beasts and then an exile and then you have pestilence and you have different like versions of like when pestilence comes um so these are to some extent Again, explanations for why bad things happen, why bad things happen, not necessarily on an individual level, but on a collective level. Why do we suffer as a people? And these are things that the rabbis felt, again, that, you know, we'd be punished on about collectively. We, we, we punish as a group. So um, that's that. It's not that section. So let's look at the next section, unless somebody has a comment or something about those seven punishments, those seven different things. This is an interesting one, I think, which is a little bit more relevant maybe than the previous one, which is, you know, like if we did our modern version of the previous one, we'd say, you know, like, why do earthquakes come? Why do wars come? Why do, well, we can say disease now too. We've dealt with our, our own shutdowns because of disease. If you will, um, you know, we don't deal with famine very much. We don't deal with animals very much, wild animals. But uh, you know, you could add your own 
ca catastrophic things, you know, hurricanes or whatever the thing that you're personally thinking of that is that's a tough one. But why do these things happen to us on a massive level? All right. Well, let's take a look at this next one, which is back to something that we've been talking about throughout Pirkei Avot, which is about the individual on a personal level. So here's a four. So we went from 10 to seven, and now we're in the fours. So this one says, Arba Midot Ba'adam, right? There are four types of characters, four types of human beings. One that says, mine is mine and yours is yours. This is a commonplace type. Some say there is a Sodom type of person from Stone, from Sodom and Gomorrah, that kind of person. He's one that says, mine is yours and yours is mine. There's an unlearned person, an Amaris, one that says, mine is yours and yours is yours. This is a pious person. One that says, mine is mine and yours is mine is a wicked person. So there's four different types of people when it comes to their stuff. Now, this one's an interesting one. Because, again, there's an interesting thing here, which is, uh, like, who really believes some of these things? Now, the idea that mine is mine and yours is yours, that's a pretty standard kind of, that's a pretty standard kind of behavior, right? That's what most people would say. And they said that's a benonit. That's the average guy, the average woman, the average man or woman says, your stuff is yours and my, and you, and your stuff is yours, and, and my stuff is mine. Unless you're married. <laughs> yes. Well, it's not your husband or wife. It's your people outside of your house, not even your kids. So that's a whole other thing is your children or grandchildren. But mine is mine, and yours is yours. That's simple. That's what most people say. And then the next one, though, uh, which is the, the person that's like from Sodom, it says, mine is yours, and yours is mine. Now, this doesn't even make any sense, right? Because that's basically saying, and, and what they're basically saying here is the is from the Sodom side of town, from that Sodom kind of place, you get people who um what's the right way of saying this? There is no uh there and the reason they call this a Sodom type of person is this isn't a person who has any sense of, um, well, I don't know how to say this in a politically correct way, but this is um, somebody who's saying, uh, your wife can be my wife, my wife can be your wife. Uh, that's why they call it a Sodom type of situation, which is that there's no differentiation between what's personal and private. And the rabbis really had a problem with that kind of behavior. And again, that's like the extreme. That's the Sodom. That's when it goes all the way to Sodom. But this idea that there is no differentiation, um, which is essentially, I'm entitled to anything you have, and you're entitled to have anything I have. And we really don't know who's going to have what. It creates not only chaos, but of course, uh, confusion and a breakdown of society. Uh -huh. And that's what Sodom, that's Sodom, right? Now, the Amaharis, the unlearned person says, uh, mine is yours. <laughs> mine is yours. Uh, oh, no, sorry. That's mine is yours and yours is mine. Uh, that's the Amaharis. Um, so, um, no, that's the that's the say that's the mine is yours and yours is mine right uh, mine is yours and yours is yours now they say that's a pious person because that from that standpoint is i have no claim on what you have and if you want to have a claim on my now you could say that seems to be not very 
protective of your stuff. But what they're also saying to some extent is, I'm not going to, I'm not going to fight you if you want to take something away from me. Now you and I could argue and probably I'm not pious enough to say that, but what they're saying is, is that, um, uh, is a chassid, and that's the word that they use, a biased person, a chassid really isn't going to argue with you over ownership of stuff. Uh, and again, it doesn't have an issue sharing stuff with you and is not looking to take something back away from you. He's not jealous or looking to take something away from you. Now, of course, the weirdest one, the strangest one is mine is mine and yours is mine. That is a wicked person, right? That's a rasha. That's someone who wants everything. And so from that standpoint, they are saying for somebody like that, um, this is uh, uh, this is not something that you want. This is not something that uh, you got to stay away from people like that because they want everything. So Again, you can kind of think about, you know, where you stand on this, whether, you know, you believe people should respect your property and whether you're entitled to other people's property. But um, the idea that, the idea that, you know, somebody thinks that they're entitled to your thing. That's a little different. Because when somebody says, look, when the when the pious person says, my thing is yours, and yours is yours, they're basically saying, look, I'm going to share with you. Come over to my house, take my stuff. You know, you want to eat dinner at my house? I don't care. I don't need to come over to your house and eat dinner too. But when somebody says that they're entitled to your things, so so if I say to somebody, so this is the difference, like you said, like, what is this? This is a stupid play on language. It's not. Because what it's saying is, is it, what it, what they're saying is, is like, if, if I'm a pious person and I'm going to say, look, I want to share with other people, right? That's me saying I'm sharing with other people. But if somebody else says I'm entitled to your stuff, that's different. Right. Because if I'm saying I want to share with you, that means I'm a pious person. But if you're saying I'm entitled to it, then you're you're a wicked person. If I willingly want to give you something that's pious on my part. But if you think you're entitled to it, if I think that yours, if I think that your stuff is my stuff, then you're a wicked person. So. Again. There's like little secrets in here that are not so obvious, but it, it's not saying like, if you just say, if you say mine is yours, that's not the same saying is, it's not the same saying as yours is mine, right? Mine is yours. is not the same saying as yours is mine. If I willingly give you something that's different from me, from you saying, I'm entitled to your thing. Think about that, folks, by the way. Because this is essentially what some people feel happens when what happens when people take things away from you and as opposed to you willingly give them to them. This is a fam famous, there's a discussion uh, that uh, Dennis Prager had years ago where he said the lowest rates of, of charitable giving are in states that have the highest tax rates. And the reason, you know, the theory behind it is, is that those states where they take pe people's money away from them are less inclined to give, not only because they have less money, because they don't necessarily have less money, but they feel like they've already given. They've already had it taken away from them. And so people tend to be a little less generous with their charity when they've already felt like they've given it's already been taken from them well it's not just taken right this the state has taxed and distributed in a way that they want not the way the charitable giver wants to give that's right. taken it's taken from them. Um, it's I, been taken from them. 
I have another, I, another comment. I, it, it's very interesting because um, I, I always joke um, uh, with, uh, with glory, you know, what's, uh, what's, uh, what's mine is mine and what's yours is mine. Or she jokes with me, but never knew where it came from. I mean, it's well, just something I've said over years. I don't know. I don't know that, the, by the way, I don't know that this is the first time that this was said. So I don't know that. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to assume that this is the first, but this is 2000 years old. So this might, this might be, this might be one of the earliest places that, that it's in. look a lot of the, we will talk about this and we'll, well, read it soon on Tuesdays when we get to the Proverbs, a lot of the text from, from Pirkei Avot is based on, or, or at least sounds a lot like, like Proverbs, which is the earliest, which is earlier than this. It's, you know, a few hundred years earlier than this. Uh, Proverbs has sayings that are sometimes like a little so similar. And as we saw last week, sometimes Pirkei Avot just directly, um, transcribes some of proverbs but yeah some of it is kind of proverb saying and this this is definitely more of those proverbs but yeah this is very old um and again it's a play on uh, look there's no question that this is a play on language and you know it's like, like in hebrew it's shali shalcha shalcha shali shali shalcha shalach shali which is yours is mine mine is yours you know uh, Shali means mine, Shalcha means yours. So in Hebrew, it you know it sounds even more poetic. Shali, Shalcha, Shalcha, Shali. But um, yeah, it, it's 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 similar to some of the stuff that we have in the book of Proverbs. So this one's a good one too, which has a lot to do with with uh, people's characteristics, people's how how people behave. Well, take a look at this one. There are four kinds of temperaments. So this, the, so here it said, he said, midot ba'adam. These are types of characters in human beings. Adam, again, is like human, right? But this is midot ba'deot, which is, to some extent, midot, again, same word, midot up here, types, right? Midot are types. But ba'da'ot, ba'da'ot are uh, they translate as temperaments, but da definitely has a connotation of understandings. It's a little bit more mental than simply temperaments, but it, it's, let's, you know, for the sake of it, let's use the word temperaments, as you'll see from this. Um, but this is an interesting one. I'm interested to see what people think about this one. So um, this is kind of people's responses to things there are four kinds of temperaments easy to become angry and easy to be appeased his gain disappears in his loss hard to become angry and hard to be appeased his loss disappears in his gain hard to become angry and easy to be appeased a chassi and a pious person easy to become angry and hard to be appeased a rasha a wicked. So the last two are the extremes, right? The last two are the extremes. The first two that they give us are kind of like what most people are, right? Which is easy to become angry and easy to be appeased. And the next one is hard to become angry and hard to be appeased. So this is an interesting one uh, because obviously the last one is the one that's not good because it's well you see it's a wicked person but easy to become angry and hard to be appeased so again in hebrew the word is is uh noach which is easy or chill again the word like we talked about yesterday like the word was nachem that god would chill would be at rest noach is again the name for noach for the 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 biblical noah it's chill. It's, it's calm. And kashe means easy. Or no, sorry. That's easy. Kashe, kashe is hard. So uh, noach is easy. Is that like, so easy to Hebrew. The Hebrew for uh, angry is kaas. It can be angry. And um, 
So, um, so let's 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 talk about this for a second. Let's let's drill down into this for a moment. So, obviously, the far extreme of being good, of being a Hasid, of being a pious person. Like again, this these two things definitely go together. Four types of human beings, four type of characters, and four types of temperaments. These things definitely go. And the next one will be kind of part of the same style, the same kind of grouping for me dote. But um so the best thing is to be not not again, I would say kind of calm not easy to be angered and to be easy to be appeased. Now, appeased is an interesting word because again, normally we would say, well, you're appeasing somebody who's been wronged or somebody who has a, a grievance against you in the first place. But this could really be understood to be, again, to be able to not, to be able to, um, uh, to be able to not, um, to be not, um, not want to take vengeance or, or to prove that they were wronged kind of thing, but appeased, you know, I mean, I guess that's all part of what the word appeased means, but um oftentimes we use the word appeased to almost like describe what happens like in a treaty or in a like you know a relationship that's not necessarily like the we the the relationship you have with your spouse or with your kids with the friend that they're appeased it seems a little bit more formal but anyways i don't know maybe that's my con that's the way i think about it but um but for us, it really is like, will they will they still want to get what's due to them out of this wrong that happened to them? That's that's definitely here, which is again is part of appeasement. I'm not saying it's not. I'm just saying this is really also can be more personal and intimate than just appeasement between peoples. So um so with normal people or the people that we see the most kind of they they might be easy to be angry but they also might be at the same time easy to be appeased and they're basically saying like in that situation you know it's kind of a wash right his gain his 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 easy to be appeased disappears in in being angry easy the next one, hard to become angry and hard to be appeased, his loss, which again you could say is his his um his loss is that it's hard for him to be appeased. His loss disappears in his gain, which is again, it's a wash. It's a wash. So it could you could read those either way, you know, in any way, it's saying he's not, you don't get there's no benefit. Which is why somebody who's hard to get angry and also has no issue being appeased, that's a really special person. But the really tough person is the person who won't be appeased and who also is too easy to get angry. So that's clearly what you don't want to be. You don't want to be that last one. You don't want to be the one who's hard to settle down and also... Uh, once he gets angry, but also he's very easily angered. You don't want to be that kind of person. You don't want to be that person that, again, is known to be somebody who is going to get e easily angry and is also then never going to chill out once they're once people are trying to make up with them. I don't want to hear from you. So you don't want to be that person. You don't want to be in a situation. So that is definitely something to think about.
making it tough on people, whoever they are, friends, family, strangers, people we live next to. These are all things we're trying to avoid. So, so let's take a look at the next Arba Midot. So this is Arba Midot. This is Arba Midot. Let's look at this Arba Midot. Midot. There are four types of students or disciples. Tommy Dane. Quick to comprehend and quick to forget. His gain disappears and is loss. Slow to comprehend and slow to forget. His loss disappears in his gain. Quick to comprehend and slow to forget. He is a, a chacham. He's a wise man. And slow to comprehend and quick to forget. This is an evil portion. So again, it doesn't say rasha. It doesn't say a wicked person. But it does say a chelik ra, a, a, a bad, it's a bad apple. It's a bad, it's a bad thing to get. You don't want that. You don't want to have a student like that. You don't want to have one that can't learn very fast and also can't remember the stuff that they're taught. This is definitely the case for teachers. Teachers will find students that can't comprehend stuff quick and they don't forget the stuff. That's the ideal, right? That's the wise person. But for people who forget, even though they learn fast, they forget, right? That's the first person. They learn fast, but they forget. They can't remember anything. There's no, whatever gain they had, whatever advantage they had is lost with what they, with their missing. And for someone who's slow to figure this stuff out, he can't really understand it. He need to keep repeating it over and over and over again. Well, in the end, they also might be the kind of person that doesn't forget But his loss from not, not learning the stuff quick and disappears and whatever advantage it is that they don't forget the stuff. It's like, how, how long will it take for them to learn it? Maybe they won't even learn it because they, they, you know, they don't have the time. They don't, people don't have the patience to teach them. So yeah, they won't forget it, but who's going to spend time with them? So this is a problem. So those are the bad ones. And again, the, the ones that are good and the ones that are really bad. So it kind of starts off with the, the ones that are fair, kind of just not going to, not going to, not going to really have any advantage, positive or negative. It's just kind of in betweens the C students, if you will, or the C types of people. Or again, as we go through these things, these are the things that like most people are, but you don't really want to be, you want to be, you want to be the pious person. You want to be the smart person. You want to be the person who is going to be known to be a good, the good one there. Okay. So that's the four types of students. So it's, again, they translate as disciples, students, right? Well, however you want to understand it, people who study with you. So take out the next one. The next one is Midot. Again, Arba Midot, but donates Daka. The people who give charity. Four types of charity givers. So these are all very similar structures, right? You can probably figure out what how this is going to break down. You see the pattern here. But look at this one. He who wishes to give, but that others should not give. His eye is to evil to that which belongs to others. He who wishes that others should give, but that he himself should not give, his evil eye is towards that which is his own. He who desires that he himself should give and that others should give, he is a chassid, he is a pious man. And he who desires that he himself should not give, and that others too should not give, this is a wicked man. So, again, you wind up with the two extremes at the end, right? Um, 
um, they're not in good shape. The first two, third one is good, and the fourth one is really bad. So the first two, as you can see here, is it says here, Enu Ra'a, right? Enu, Enu Ra'a, that is the evil eye. Enu Ra'a. So either his evil eye is on others, and what they have, or the evil eye is on that which is his own. So there's, as I said before, there's an idea that the evil eye is kind of like a, a way of creating envy, right? And and kind of basically saying, if other people are looking at stuff like they want it, they're going to cause problems. So this is um, what we said before. Kainahora, right? When we say no evil eye. Evil eye is what people have for their stuff or for their own stuff or for other people's stuff. So they can have it even on their own stuff when they look at their stuff and they're saying, I don't want anybody to have any of this. I don't want to share it. I don't want to have anybody touch it. They're essentially causing an evil eye on their own stuff, but they can also cause an evil eye on other people's stuff. Right? So this is an interesting thing, which is that you have this ability to create this energy for people's stuff. Any comments? Anybody have anything to say about that very interesting text, which is, again, the way that people give. This is an interesting one, by the way, too, because I want to point out that while, again, ideally someone wants to give, wants themselves, they, they, they take pleasure in giving, and they want others to also share in that, too. What's interesting about that is that what, what we understand, and to some extent, is that there are people out there who want, they, they'll give. The first one is they want to, they'll give, but they don't want others to give. They want to close off that for other people is almost to say, no, no one else should have the opportunity to give the way I'm giving. I'm going to shut that off. I'm going to create a situation where I'm the one who gives. You, you, I'm going to bully you out of the ability to give and to be able to 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 have that same kind of ability to to do tzedakah as I am. We, and we that, need to find we need to find that hero. <laughs> this is not this is not a hero. This is somebody who this is somebody who is trying to define to they're greedy with their own with their own giving. Uh, and there are people like that. And again, you know, you like you want somebody who wants to go crazy with the giving, but you also want people to want other people to give too, right? And you know, you think like who would possibly not want other people to give? But there are people who literally would 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 literally say, "Hey, look, how much do you how much do you need for this thing? Okay, I'll give it. I don't want anyone else's name to be on it." I mean, all I can tell you is I've had that experience before in people where they don't want anyone else's name on whatever they were giving, and they're saying, "I'm doing it," and no one else is given towards this. Um, and again, like you're like, "Oh, that's great. They want to do it, and they want to take credit for it." But the problem is, is that if you're denying, like if if your charity is so focused on your charity giving is predicated on you getting the attention for it, there's something wrong. And and again, it's not not the way we're supposed to be living. We want other people, we want to give and we want other people to give. We want other people to have that same feeling of giving and stock of it that we do. And so it's not fair, but yeah, there are people who like that, and people who who want the attention, and they want they want to have that, and they close that off. It's not good. It's a fault on their part. So it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a personality fault, it really is. Rabbi, Rabbi, do yeah. you have any emails of those people? <laughs> just I'm just asking, you know. Thanks, I, I need to add them to the list. Thankfully, I'm just trying to think if we've ever had them at, at, at the synagogue. I've seen it with um, a bully giver. I mean, how did you find those? I've seen. I've seen it. I saw it. I saw it years ago at Heschel, and I'm like, 
is this really happening? Are people really fighting over their name recognition on an event? And I saw it. I'm like, this is wild. But um, yeah, I mean, people would be like, no, it's, 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 I don't want that person. I don't want that person's name on this, on this, on this, anywhere near this building or, or this, this wall. I'm like, are you serious? Like, why would you? It's, it's weird, but uh, there are people like that. And, you know, I guess, look, if you're, <laughs> If you're the one who's who's having to make these de decisions, um, you have to decide what you're willing to put up with. You have to decide, you know, look, if somebody's willing to give and they say, I don't want that person to give or I don't want anybody else's name to be involved in this, what are you going to do? Say no, because you're going to lose that gift. And it's not like the other person, like let's say that one person's giving 100000 and the other person's giving 10000 and the person who's giving 100,000 says, I'm only going to give you the 100,000 if that 10,000 giver is nowhere near my thing, my gift. I don't see their name on the building. I don't see their name atta attached to this event. And I, 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 they're just not, they're, they're, they're not in my league and I don't want to have them anywhere near me. You'd be like, well, that's not really nice, which is what this just said, but it does happen. And, and, and as the, as the, person involved with this i can tell you it puts you in a really bad situation because what are you gonna do tell the hundred thousand dollar giver sorry we you know take your hundred thousand dollars back we're gonna take the ten thousand from this person because they're not they're not telling you they're not telling us what strings are attached to it i mean look i haven't had anyone say hey i don't want anyone else to give in my experience but we, i've had we've had bullies and we've had people who've given us money and they they bullied us on how it was supposed to be spent or how they were going to how and when they were going to give it or what conditions they would give it and there are cases where I just haven't taken the money because i just know it's not going to it's not going to end well but there are people who 100 percent bully you know and look i mean sometimes the bullying is done not for the sake of ego, but for the sake of political considerations or, or the person's, uh, you know, the person has a certain, uh, a certain take on something and you have to put up with it. And, and people do that all the time, right? They say, well, he's a big donor, so we got to keep our mouth shut and let him say whatever he wants. Uh, and in some cases, as I said, the, the agenda that they're pushing is actually probably the right agenda but people don't like dealing with it they don't like being bullied by their donors but i mean <laughs> i remember years ago a true story about 10 years ago i was talking with uh i was at a dinner and shelly adelson was there and yeah it was in it was in beverly hills it was a dinner raising money for for Yad Vashem, for the Holocaust Museum in Israel, and and Adelson was there, and he's he gave him and Miriam Adelson gave a lot of money to the to Yad Vashem, a lot. Their name is right out in the front of the courtyard. But um, we were talking about birthright, and I had said to him at the dinner, I had said not about Yad Vashem. I said about birthright. I said. It's amazing that you gave this money. It was forty million dollars that he gave that year to to uh, Taglit for birthright trips. So I said it's phenomenal that you gave forty thousand dollars. I said that's amazing. It was by far the biggest gift they had gotten. Because by the way, now that he's dead, they've pulled that money down. They were giving forty million for a few years, and now they just pulled it down to ten million. So there's going to be less kids that can go because they they're. they're they're not getting the same Adelson donations that they got. I mean, they're getting donations from other places, but the Adelsons told them before Shelley died, but it didn't happen until after he died, that uh, they have to start figuring out at Birthright how to get money from other places because they said, we're not going to do this every year. They're still the biggest donor, by the way. They still give $10 million a year to Birthright. But but Shelley, when, when I said to Adelson, I said, thank you for, for doing this donation. He said... I gave it to them with conditions. He basically flat out told me that he bullied them. And I said, well, 
what are you talking about? Like, what did you, what did you do? He said, I gave it, I gave the money on the condition. They would not tell kids that they, if they had been to Israel before that they weren't eligible to go. Because initially birthright had a policy that said, if you've been to Israel before on a trip, you couldn't go again with birthright. So if you'd been with family or if you'd been on a school program uh, as a kid, you weren't eligible to go. That the trip was only for people who'd never been before. Now, birthright had a reason for doing that, which is that they didn't have as they didn't have enough money when they started. It wasn't a big enough program, and they said, "Look, we got to prioritize people who've never been there before." So they did it for a good reason. It wasn't like they just arbitrarily said we're not going to do it. But Adelson said. Look, my kids, other people's kids, people who've been to Israel before, people who have family in Israel, whatever, they've been to Israel. If you're dis if you're disallowing them from going, you're taking away from some of the kids who will be the best advocates for Israel this opportunity. You're punishing them for the fact that they may have gone when they're five years old. It's ludicrous, it's stupid. So he came at it from another standpoint, which is this is a stupid rule. So he made them change it. He said, I'll give you this money, but you're changing the rule. You changed it. So I know for a fact it happens. And sometimes it happens. We can, we, one can make the argument that people do it out of the right motivation. I don't think he was wrong. I think he was right. I think I'd actually known he had done that, by the way. I think I had actually had read that he had made that precondition that the money would go there as long as they wouldn't disallow kids who'd been there before. But um, yeah, I mean, I, to I told him, I think you're right. But it was definitely, you know, him dictating to them what the, what the money, you know, how the money would be used and, and what his values were. So you have enough money, you can do that. And, and I mean, I don't know. I, that's just one example of one that I know and discussed it with the people responsible for it. So it does happen. And I guess sometimes it doesn't happen with any good reason, which is, you know, people's egos. Yeah. Well, that, <clears throat> that's much different than, than me saying, you know, I'm not going to give a dime if, you know, if Joy Shulman gives money because, you know, I don't want to yep. be associated with her. You know, it's totally different. Yep. Right? It, it, well, it's totally different other than the fact that, yeah, I mean, the motivations behind that, it. That's that's bullying. That's really bull. Yeah, it's conditional. But it is a similar issue, which is, I, I'm going to give it based on, you know, quid pro quo or whatever the, whatever the decision is, you know, that you have to make in order for me to give you, you know, for you to get the money or um, but it does happen. I, I, it's happened to me so rarely and whatever the conditions are that have been placed on money that, that I've raised have been, I've been fine with, but, um, yeah, I mean, it does happen. I haven't raised the kinds of money that some of these other people have that I, you know, I know that the more money you raise, the more kinds of things you get, you know, the more conditions and the more, you know, stories of, of, uh, of, you know, what, you know, what you'll see, the, it's just a, just a numbers game. You know, the more you come into contact with, with donors. Uh, so that's my, that's my experience with it. Um, so, and, and by the way, that's not, I, I, I want to make it clear. I have stories that are not good stories that I'm not going to share, but it's not like every story I've had about donations have been good, but I don't have anywhere near these kinds of stories that people have had. And, and for the most part, like if it went south, it went south. I didn't salvage it. Like I can't think of anything where I've salvaged it by bending over backwards or compromising my integrity or my morals on how I was going to get the money. I, honestly, I'm not saying that because like, I've never done anything wrong. I'm not saying that, but I, I'm saying that I don't remember ever taking money from somebody because, you know, that where I had to, you know, do something or, or agree to something that was not good for the organization I was a part of or, or 
you know, not good for me or was ethically a compromising situation. I just haven't had that. Honestly, I never have. So, um, you know, I, I, I have a interesting, <clears throat> to me at least, I just, I just thought of this. I, I wonder what, way, way back the ancients, when they were, when they were required to bring sacrifices, right? Mm -hmm. And at the time that was their, their consideration, right? Their money. Yep. Well, I'm wondering if they ever said, you know, if they were ever bitter. I, you don't have an answer for this. I mean, it's just a discussion point. They said, you know what? I have nothing else to give to anything else. I'm giving all my prized butchery to the, to God, you know. I have no other charity to give. Uh, I think I think that I think that um look when people had to give money to whatever government they were part of whatever king or whoever asked for money and then they had to give money to the temple and they had to get like i think at certain points people would uh lose their minds but but when the people gave money to the temple for example the priests they gave a tenth they gave a tithe um Maybe they paid some taxes to the government, had to give a cow or a bull or a, or a goat or a sheep to the government in collecting taxes. But I will tell you, the idea that people would give 30 to 40% of their money to a government, people in our country, they... um they had a revolution over their taxes and their taxes in many cases were less than our taxes are today. So, I mean, most of us have been born into this situation of taxes, right? Most of us have been paying income tax every day that we've ever lived, whatever job we ever had, whether we had a newspaper route or, a, you know, worked at a grocery store or whatever it is, most of us have never worked without paying income tax. And again, most of us have paid 30 to 40% of our salaries to taxes for our whole lives. In the ancient world, people would have literally lost their minds if they got taxed at 30%. Would not have taken it. If somebody would have come every year and taken a third of their sheep, they would have lost their mind. They would have had a revolution. They did. They would have had revolutions. They did have revolutions. So, you know, look, we are somehow okay with that. You know? We're okay with the 10% sales tax we pay and the 30% income tax we pay and all the other taxes that we pay and capital gains and all the other stuff that we do when we make money or, or pretty much do anything. And we pay taxes on it. So, um, we uh, we have every kind of tax, consumption taxes, income taxes, sales tax. So the worst one, the worst one, the worst tax is the use tax. Does everybody know what that is? Raise your hands. I'll tell you what it is. You buy pro you buy something for your office. A business has to pay a use tax. So you pay a sales tax on that desk. And then annually, you have to itemize all your assets and pay a use tax. Now, now, granted, they don't come and, you know, they're not going to steal your business. You come up with your best estimate, but you actually have to pay a use to use those desks and chairs and computers, you know, whatever you have at your business. Sorry, I had to throw that in there. Yeah, there's, uh, there are taxes on taxes that we are paying so um yeah yeah um and what's interesting is that in our country our tax rates are lower than they are in other industrialized countries so uh people in other countries seem to be okay with even more taxes so um yeah that's the way we live you know and again one can make the argument that that's 
the cost of civilization or the cost of the the societies that we create but are we getting are we getting value from that i don't know um this is these are Mm -hmm. this is what we deal with today folks this is these are the these are the um consequences of of you know living the way we live the agreements the covenant to some extent that we live in right now so let's take a look at so we talked about uh charity just now the people who are how they're giving we also talked about previously though the one before that was how people learn right this one's okay. similar to that right? This is somebody who goes to the Beit Hamidrash, which is what we're in right now, the house of study. This is a virtual house of study. There are four types of people who go to the house of study. He who attends but does not practice, he receives a reward for attendance. He who practices but does not attend, he receives a reward for practice. He who attends and practices, he is a chassid, right? He is a pious man. He who neither attends nor practices, he is a wicked man. So what we're talking about here, of course, is people who are engaged in Jewish study, right? Jewish study. People who know, people who are learning, people who are studying, and then people who put that into practice. So you get credit for just studying it, just, just, just studying it. There's, there's a reward in attendance, right? And for those who are, uh, you know, practicing, they're they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, but they don't really attend or or learning about it. There's a reward for that too. Now, obviously, the best is when you study it and you do it. That's where you're a chassi. That's the that's the again following this formula. That's what you want to be. You want to be number three, the third option. The fourth option, of course, is always the bad option. That's the one you want to avoid. This is somebody who doesn't attend or practice. And again, there are way too many people who fall into this uh -huh. part, right? This is our problem is we got, we got, we have less people that are falling into these two first two categories, which are at least going to be okay. They're getting some credit, but the people who aren't doing either one, that's the last. We have way too many of those. But everybody here in this group right here is falling into number three, which is really good. Really good. Now, here's an interesting one about how people um, kind of viewed their students. And this is kind of more about the rabbis themselves, right? There are four types among those who sit before the sages, right? the chachamim, the sages, the chachamim, the spog, which, by the way, that's it right here, the spog, which is Greek, the word sponge. A spoke. The other words are not, not uh, Greek words, and they're uh, Hebrew words. The funnel, the strainer, and the sieve. And these are all things that we can find around the kitchen, around the home. These are different ways that we um, wash things, clean things, fill things. These are tools. But they're compared to kinds of people. A sponge, as you can expect, is someone who soaks up everything. Just soaks up everything. And we still say that. When a student is like a sponge, they just hear everything. They pick up everything. Funnel takes in on one end and lets out the other. Which is, well, maybe not something... You want to be, which is stuff just passes through. A strainer lets out the wine and retains the lees. That's also not something that you really want to have because you're losing the good stuff. You're only left with the bad stuff. Not a good one either. To some extent, maybe even worse. The last one is a sieve which lets out the coarse meal and retains the choice flour. So this is a good thing, right? This is a better thing because it is going to keep the good stuff. 
So maybe the first three could all be considered not necessarily great. The first one at least is getting the good stuff or because they get everything. But how do they know which is good and which is bad? So this one is structured a little differently, right? This one isn't one and two are average. And then three is great and four is bad. This one actually four is the best. And the first one is kind of maybe better, maybe. But two and three are not the good ones here. So the, what they're talking about here, again, is the way people learn, right? And so what do they keep? What do they retain? Whether they retain stuff, which, again, it kind of goes back to this one before that we read. People who are quick to learn and slow to comprehend. And so there's descriptions here about, you know, students before. But this one is a little different. It's structured a little different. And, again, compares the people to different types of utensils that you'd find around the house. Some of them we still have, or most of them we really still have, right? So this is an interesting one here that I want to talk about because um, we're going to read a couple more. And I'm not sure that we're going to get to the end of the chapter. No, we won't for sure. We'll get close today. But this one is a really, really uh, interesting one. I think one that, again, when we talk about relevance to today's world, this is definitely one that I think people will, it'll speak to you, I think. So, kol ahava, all the love, all love, types of love that depend on something. When that thing ceases, the love ceases. And all the love that does not depend on anything, that will never cease. What is an example of love that depended on something? Such was the love of Amnon for Tamar. And what is an example of love that did not depend on anything? Such was the love of David and Jonathan. Now, this is an interesting one because it deals with what kinds of love are there out there. And we would say that this is conditional love and unconditional love. Love that's based on something in particular. And something that is, uh, again, there's a quid pro quo. The love is based on something that, that needs to happen or must be there. And then the other love is unconditional and doesn't need any type of, of interaction or transaction. Nothing has to be given for it. And they compare it to stories in the Torah, in the Bible, specifically stories that surround David, King David. Now, David, we know from the Bible in the book of Samuel, he has a son and daughter, Amnon and Tamar. And Amnon is one of his oldest sons, son he loves very much. And remember, Tamar is married, uh, Tamar is um, David's daughter. And Tamar is uh, has a brother named Absalom. Well, Amnon loves Tamar. He falls in love with her, and he essentially rapes her. He, he he tricks her into coming to him when he pretends he's sick, and she comes to him, and he attacks her, and he has sex with her, and then he throws her out. He gets upset because he's almost like humiliated by the fact he had sex with her. He's disgusted with her and with himself, and it, it's a terrible situation. And, of course, Absalom avenges her by killing Amnon, and then Absalom gets exiled, and he ends up having a revolution against David, and David actually gets chased out of Jerusalem over this. So the whole situation devolves into a civil war, literally Jews killing other Jews during the time of David and his son Absalom, who he loved. Absalom was his favorite son. From what we know, David had a much closer relationship with Absalom than he did with Amnon, with Adonia with even King Solomon. David doesn't ever have a conversation or ever has just seems to have that same affection for any other child except for Absalom. But he ends up having to, to kill him. He doesn't kill him, but his general, his his cousin and general, Yoav, kills Absalom. But it's a terrible scene. It's a terrible scene of the Bible. But it really is a scene where we see a rape happen because Amnon is 
infatuated or or in lust, I would say. Infatuation implies something maybe nicer. He's totally obsessed with his sister, and he wants his half-sister, and he wants to have her sexually. So his love for her is clearly not based on any kind of real, you know, any type of understanding other than he lusted after her. And it's a terrible example of a relationship. It's like the worst real example of a relationship. So that's a conditional love. And it's one that is like the worst example of a conditional love. Okay. So then we get to the one that they say is the good example. So in this case, there's two examples. There's a good example and a bad example. No in-betweens, just a good and a bad. And what's interesting about this is that it's not a man and a woman. The first one was a man and a woman. It was not a good example. This one is a man with another man. This is David with Jonathan. So it's interesting that the love that they picked to be the example par excellence of love is the love of David and Jonathan. How do we know they loved each other? Because the Bible says they loved each other. Now, some people have tried to say that this was a homosexual relationship, that this is a relationship that, you know, they, you know, had very intimate feelings about each other. There's nothing in the Bible that tells us that. He does say that he loved Jonathan, that David loved Jonathan. It says so, but it doesn't say that they had any kind of physical relationship. It says simply that they loved him. Now, they were almost like brothers. They were spent time together in the court. David was married to Jonathan's sister, Michal. So they were related. He was his brother-in-law. And of course, David fought for Saul, for Jonathan's father, and was a part of the, assumedly, you know, the inner circle. And yet David and Jonathan's relationship becomes strained and, and pre very precarious because eventually Saul wants to kill David and Jonathan's put in the middle and he he wants to save his friend, and he does. So it's a very powerful relationship. It's a beautiful story in the book of Samuel. Uh, not one, again, that gives us any indication that there's anything sexual here, though some people have tried to read that write, read that into the story. But regardless of like what it was that made them love each other, the Bible holds it up as a as a, definitely an example of love and the talmud the mission this mission it goes even further in pirkei avot to say that this is the example of beautiful love it doesn't depend on anything and that kind of love never ends it never ends and of course that's what we want we want to have love that never ends a love that never has no ending. And so what's so beautiful of that is that, again, David and Jonathan were separated by, Jonathan had to listen to his father Saul and basically not have anything to do with David. And again, Saul and Jonathan ended up getting killed in battle with the Philistines. But David and, and Jonathan never stopped loving each other. And they have a relationship that is not going to ever it never ends. And so it's interesting that that's love that they say is a, a love that never dies. Not a love between two people of different, of, you know, male and female. They didn't have to. They didn't have to. So it's very interesting that they gave an example of love that was not a good form of love between a man and a woman. So again, I don't know that we have to read I mean, we're, we're not going to read into it that they're encouraging people to love people of the same gender. That's not what they're saying. But they're saying there is an example of love between two people of the same gender whose love was transcendent and unconditional. And an example of the kind of love we're supposed to have with people, which is it's not based on what they're going to give you. So it's a beautiful message of love that is not based on 
things, money, beauty, sex. Anybody have any other things that love is based on that is not what it's supposed to be based on? Anybody? Any other things that love is not supposed to be based on? And sometimes power. power. There you go. Anybody? So. Lust. Lust, yes. Yeah, that's the um, I'm known in Tom on lust. So these are things that, again, what's so amazing about this is they took stories from the Bible to illustrate these things. And again, the David and Jonathan one's tough because we don't have that much text about it other than they loved each other. That when David, when Jonathan dies, David is almost inconsolable. He's, he's, he writes song, he writes a song about Dave, about Jonathan and Saul being killed. He's very um, broken up over it. And it's clear that it, it affects him, which again is interesting because it, it tells you that For whatever David did as, as king, and let's say David, and we assume, again, David was careful that he didn't have people in Saul's family. We know parts of Saul's family were wiped out when David became king in a very Game of Thrones type of way. David had a real feeling for Jonathan, and at least for Jonathan's, for Jonathan, and probably maybe had, was in an interesting situation with Jonathan's family, which is... can't really i mean maybe i should kill these people but i can't but some of saul's family 100 percent gets killed and david probably had a lot to do with that but uh, his feelings for jonathan transcended that assumedly again even in situations which were not the best and so saul according to according to the story david even kept one of uh, uh jonathan's children alive because you know he has such a fondness for jonathan even though this this child could have been an heir to the you know pretender to the throne so uh this is this is uh an interesting example many people would say of love that is transcendent it, it is not contingent on anything it's just love so this is a beautiful one because again, this is about love. It's not about anything other than it's not about anything other than this beautiful feeling that we should have. Ahava. And it's not conditional. Okay. So this is uh I thought maybe we'd finish with this, but we'll we'll see how much further we read we read. This is a very famous uh section. It's one that we've talked about before. It's one we talk about when we read this portion of the Torah. Uh, it's one that we refer to a lot. And it's one of the most famous parts of Perkava. And it's 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 like the last one to some extent, because again, the last one's talked about fours. Now we're out of those. And this was Kol Ahava, all love. And this is kol, kol machloket. So that's kol all love. This is kol machloket. So that's all love. And this is all dispute. Every dispute that is for the sake of heaven, shehi l'shem shemayim, for the sake of heaven, will in the end endure. Which again is the same phrase we have, right? Which is, uh -huh. uh, you know, that this will always be around, right? Which is the controversy? Which is the which is the machloket? Which is the dispute? That's for the sake of heaven. Such was the controversy of Hillel and Shammai. And what is the controversy for that? For that, it was not for the sake of heaven. That was the controversy of Korach and his congregation. So this is the story we read in the Book of Numbers. When Korah and his party objected to Moses and said, Moses, you're not the one in charge by yourself. We're all holy. God made all of us holy. Why are you better than us? That's the story of Korah from Numbers. Now, Hillel and Shammai, 
are much more contemporaneous to Pirkei Avot. We know about Hillel and Shammai. These were the two schools that were rival schools during the time of the temple, of the last part of the temple, around the time of King Herod. Hillel and Shammai debated everything. According to the Talmud, they argued over everything. We talked about the fact they argued over which way you're supposed to light Hanukkah candles. They talked about which way you're supposed to uh, which way you're supposed to pretty much celebrate every holiday. But they argued about little details about which way we were supposed to do something. They would take, they would, they would stake out different sides. And according to tradition, of course, we follow the Hillel, the side of Hillel. But the reason that we we follow Hillel, by the way, is because the Talmud itself says that Hillel, and by the way, the Talmud is the mission at least, is edited by Hillel's family, including <laughs> Rabbi Judah Hanasi. So we're we get Hillel a little bit more partial. Uh, a little bit more partial to Hillel. But what's interesting about the, the, what the Mishnah and the Talmud say is that what, one of the reasons why we we keep Hillel's teachings normally versus Shammai's is that um, Hillel taught, according to tradition, he taught Shammai's tradi uh, traditions including in, in addition to his own. So he'd say, this is what we teach, but this is what Shammai teaches. And so for the reason that he actually kept both teachings and, and respected the other teaching enough to actually give it credence, they said that th that because of this kind of behavior, we follow Hillel's teachings normally because, again, Hillel was the more um, respectful and the more, um, well, to some extent, um, the understanding is he really must have taken consideration of Shammai's teachings because if he's going to keep them, he respects them enough to keep them. Where, again, there's this kind of understanding that you respect the decisions that you don't agree with. Now, the Talmud is basically telling us, look, we want to keep those decisions. We want to have those discussions. We want to have those machloket. We want to have those disputes forever. Because if they're for the sake of heaven, they're not about the egos of the people that are wow. arguing. Them, then it really is for the sake of heaven. So what's interesting about this today is we would say that when the Supreme Court, for example, decides a case, it keeps the majority and the minority opinion. It keeps the, the different justices' yeah. opinions. Because in some cases, again, those opinions we can go back to in the future, you know, years from now, we can say, look at what this person said. Look at how this person understood, you know, this level of it, which we're only now fully understanding today. And we do that all the time in the Talmud. We'll read something, including stuff that we're reading now, and we'll be like, oh, wow, like that's exactly what we're dealing with today. And so doing that by keeping these decisions, we some cases we think, well, that's just wrong. That doesn't make any sense. Sometimes those things that we say don't make any sense actually make a lot of sense. It just takes time for us to sometimes catch up with those situations. But if we we have people who are looking at every possible angle, if they're looking at all different sides, we're going to come up with some very interesting decisions. We're going to have much livelier debate. We have make be able to make more informed decisions. And then on top of that, we have those decisions that we can come back to later on and go, you know, that's a really good point that that person made 500 years ago or 200 years ago or 50 years ago. We can say, you know, that person really made a good point, which we should revisit. And because we it was all inclusive and they included all of the thinking. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Thank this you. is a really important idea for us today which mm -hmm. is that we have to understand that when we have important debates, when we have significant debates, we need to listen to the different sides. We need to hear them out. And even if we don't decide that we're going to keep that decision that they came up with, we don't ignore it. We don't say, eh, it doesn't matter. We don't have to remember that because again, it's at our own, it's our own peril that we ignore this or that we put it away. And what really happens is, is that when we, we, if we can respect each other enough to have a, a respectful debate, then what happens is, is then we also create a society that is tolerant and is more accepting of differences of opinion and doesn't force people to say, 
hey, look, if you don't agree with what I say, get the hell out of the country. Because when we get to that kind of stage, when people can't respect each other, or we we have to say, well, if you don't like it, get out, or I'm getting out because I don't like who was elected president, then we have a problem that, again, we've left the realm of we have a civil discourse or we have a society where people who are going to have differences of opinion, which are always are going to be differences of opinion, that we can have people live together and not kill each other over their differences of opinion. And so Judaism says, look, we got to keep these, we got to keep our community together. And we do that when we recognize that these arguments are for the sake of heaven. They're not insignificant. God cares about them. When we say it's for the sake of heaven, we're saying God cares about it because we understand that it's because of our belief and our and our desire to understand and to try to do God's will as much as we can, that we're even having this argument in the first place. It's not an argument about ego. It's not an argument about, I want to be right, and if I'm right, you're wrong. And this is the problem that we have, again, especially in our, our own time now, where uh-huh. people literally have to say, look, it's my way or the highway. And um, they mean that to somebody else, or they mean it for themselves, that if you don't follow my answer, I'm getting out of here and I'm taking my stuff and I'm leaving. And so this is the this is the situation that we have um, that we really have to pull ourselves back from the precipice on this, which is, again, to understand that these are for the sake of heaven. How do we know this? Because the Torah and the rabbis infer this from the Torah. The Torah never says what made Korah go off, go, go crazy in the first place. The Torah just says he attacks Moses. Well, it's not there is what did Korah care about? What did Moses say? What did Moses do that made Korah attack him and say, who are you, Moses, to speak up? We don't have the argument. And because the argument is there, the rabbis inferred the reason it's not there was because it wasn't important. The Torah didn't keep it because it was not a machloket. It was not a dispute, a disagreement. For the sake of heaven. It had nothing to do with that because it was only about Korach's own, own, ah. own ego and own power. And so that's why it's missing from the Torah. And they say it's missing. We know it's missing. So their midrash, their exegesis on this is it's because it wasn't important. That's why it's not there. And that is because, again, the Torah will only document the arguments, the, the, the nature of the arguments, if they're substantial and if they're worthy to understand that there's different points that were all being argued for good intent, that people were trying to understand how to do God's will. They might have had differences of opinion. They might have had different practices. They might have had different understandings of how they were supposed to do something, but we keep them because they were based on honest debate and honest, logical, even in some cases, points. And this is what we need to have in our society today. It cannot be a zero-sum game and say, well, we're sorry. You and your points are all wrong. We have to be able to say, look, maybe this person has a point here. Maybe we should listen to this. And again, not everybody who argues with us has a legitimate point, but they might. And we don't have to say, well, just because they're on the other side of the fence, that they're 100% wrong. And so this is where we really get to a point where when we have people who can work together who have uh, a respect for each other, who have a respect for the the process of debate, of disagreement, then what we find is we can uh, get over and and get beyond the uh, the controversies and the disagreements without people threatening each other, without violence, and without um, Again, people saying, you know, I'm taking these people outside of the country or I'm taking these, taking myself outside of the country or we need a national divorce or we need a national, we need to break the country up into different, into different regions. Uh, All that kind of stuff is based on the fact that really, if we have, if we, if we can't agree and we can't um, find common, um, uh, you know, a common a, a commonality in our in our union. That again, we've gone back to uh, to to civil war times, which is which is a pretty scary thought.
and it's definitely are we, something. Rabbi, so, yeah. are we seeing something like that in people who are giving up living in a particular state because of major differences and moving to a state where there are fewer differences? Uh, in, they're not leaving the entire country, but they are leaving the community that they live in because they cannot seem to resolve differences. Well, they're definitely, you know, look, I, I was talking about this recently with, with somebody, I think like yesterday, again, uh, about this, about people who've left California. Um, and New York. Yeah. So people, people moving out of state. Um, yes. And I'm much familiar, much more familiar with it from with California than I am with New York, because I live in California. And right. I have friends who've made moves outside of California and I, and I've seen, um, yeah, and I and I'm in some of these states. I'm in one of them right now in Nevada. We were just talking uh, two days ago about the influx of people to uh, the, the Henderson area who've who've uh, right. fled California. Um, here's 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 what here's what in effect is happening though, and and this is been well documented in Arizona, which is another state that I've spent a lot of time in lately. Yes, there have been a lot of people from California who've abandoned California because of the politics and mm -hmm. because they the state is uh, in an intractable situation where they can never, we can we can't pull back from the, we're, we're already over the, the ledge. We're not crossing the ledge, we're over the ledge. Right. Uh, we went off the cliff. Now, there are definitely are people who feel that and who and have made the decision to move. Uh, in my experience, that there have been people who've done that, no question. Uh, I think some people who've who've done it more for um, politics have moved to states like Idaho or Texas, where things are a little bit more, um, you know, where they're more red. Uh, for people who've moved to Arizona or Nevada, what, what I've seen or what, and again, I, I don't think I'm speaking anecdotally or just out of like my my experiences or or uh, or or just what I've seen. But I think that uh, in those states, in some of these states, the states have actually have gotten bluer because they're getting people who are more liberal, who are Californians who've moved to these states and the states are becoming uh, more liberal. So, I mean, that's definitely happened in Arizona. It's also happened to some extent a little bit in Nevada. Um, but but I will say what what I think happens consciously or 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 just because people have to do it, they move out of state because they can't afford to raise a family, can't afford a house in the in the states uh -huh. that they were from. So if the, if the move was made less for politics but more for economic reasons, I don't think they're necessarily we're going to see a shift. To, to some extent, if people, if people, kind of, if you will, take their politics with them to their to their next place, which, right. by the way, I hear from Arizona people all the time, which is, you know, keep your keep your liberal Californians from moving here. They say that all the time. I mean, they're literally like, "You're ruining our state." Um, uh, you know, there is a, a weird situation that people will say. It's not gonna. It, it's not gonna change the. It, it's it's. If if you if 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 the if you're if you are looking at it from the standpoint of of only economics, then people will say, well, you're just gonna import your politics there too. So it comes as part part of the package. I just, in my opinion, it, it's a it's kind of strange that people are gonna. Are going to take their politics with them and say, "Well, don't don't you realize that part of the reason why we have this problem is because that you're bringing right. this problem here too." So I, I I don't know what will happen um, in 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 those state in the, in the states where that's happened. Um, and again, the problem, of course, is that if if people who don't like the way the government of California is working leave, then it's not gonna. It's gonna be even worse for our state. So, I I love California, and I hope I hope our state continues to, you know, 
I, I hope we, I mean, we're, we're in a precarious situation. I'm not going to lie. I mean, uh -huh. we, we are, we have a real, we have some fundamental problems, which, which are, um, which are making it hard to live here. And there's a, at least a few people on the line right now who are not living in California and um, who lived uh -huh. in California and who aren't living there anymore. And again, everybody has their reasons for moving, but it definitely concerns me that people are abandoning the state because they don't feel like there's any hope for it. That's a, that's a really, that's a scary thing. And it's one that uh, is disheartening for somebody who, who is a native Californian and who loves, uh, who loves the state and who has no intention. I've said to people before, I have no intention of leaving the state. People ask me all the time, uh, am I going to leave if I, if I'm ever planning on leaving California and I have no intention of leaving if, leaving California. If, if, if I have to, at some point, I, I, you know, I get it. I talked to, a I talked to somebody a couple of days ago in Nevada that was like, you know, you, you almost have to be crazy not to move here and, and, and avoid the, you know, avoid the, the, the state income tax. Um, look, I get it. I mean, I, I'm not oblivious to this stuff, but I will tell you that um, if everybody who, doesn't like what's happening in California leaves, it's just going to accelerate the decay. And I, I think, I think, and the problems, and I think I'm hoping that people will, I'm hoping that people will try to figure out how to, how to make it better rather than, than, than escaping. But look, I, I get it. I mean, I'm not, I can't, I can't convince people to stay in California who have good reasons and, right. and disappointing to see them leave but i get it i mean i'm not gonna i i gotta be realistic about you know the fact that people have to do what they got to do but it, it's it's sad i mean every time that i see somebody look I, I mean i talked about this with john you know not too long ago too i mean we think about the people who've left our temple the people who've moved out of state who who are um you know who were who were past presidents of our synagogue who we still keep in contact with they you know they love our temple they loved they loved our community but they're living in texas and idaho and and washington and one of them is harvey kale who's on right now i mean look i mean there's so many people that that like it's not like i'm not gonna it's just, it's 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 sad it's it's sad for me to say that so i'm hoping that people will as the as to finish up today with the part we just read i hope that they'll understand that we can have disagreements we can have we can have arguments and and understand that if it's for the sake of heaven if it's for the sake of the well-being of our citizens and for this for the well-being of our you know of our the people of our of our society that's it's going to be okay we'll make it but um yeah we, we we've for some people we've gone over the edge it's already too late so. anyways um there's also a problem again on a national level that that um, that people are very despondent over. But look, I got to tell you, for most Americans, for most people in this country, there is no other place to live. There's they know that. There's no right. country. There's no there's no country that's better than this country. But as I shared today. I don't know if anyone, I don't share a lot on social media, folks. But we come back to what we talked about at the very beginning. I'll share it right now because, as I said, I don't share a lot on social media. But I shared this today in the midst of everything else that's going on. Here you go. Oh, one second. Shared it. I shared it for everybody, too, because... Um, I will, I will share with you what I shared today. There it is. I shared it today. The World Happiness Report came out. They announced the findings today. I shared it on the temple. So you can go look at the temple Facebook. Then I shared yeah, it but, but the U.S. isn't on it. Yeah, we are. We're 23, I said. Here's the new list. This is the World Happiness Index. As I said before, you got to be a little careful of polls, polling. But this was, uh, again, done on on uh, 
on uh, ways of kind of figuring out what um, what uh, you know what how we can kind of index these things, which are different factors. So here you see it. Israel came in at number five. Wow. United States is down here at 23. United Kingdom is at 20. We, we're not even in the top 20 anymore. These two countries I just went to, Australia and New Zealand, I can definitely see why those countries are in the top in the top 10 or so. I've been to these countries. New Zealand, for sure. Finland, Denmark, <laughs> Iceland, New Zealand. I mean, uh, Sweden, uh, Norway. Those countries all have one thing in common. They're Scandinavian. No, they got another thing in common. What? High, high, high taxes. I know. I've run into okay. multiple business people from all those countries, and they hate okay. it. I know. But I'm telling you, what's interesting about that, to get back to what we talked about before, it's not taxes that make people, <laughs> that put people, oh, all these countries have super high taxes. This country has about a 60, 70% marginal oh, tax. It's horrible. But, wow. but what happens is that people still can find and can maintain a level of happiness there, which is interesting, which is, again, is if people feel that the things that are being taxed on, they're getting value for, which includes their health care, it includes their education, uh -huh. it includes transportation, it includes their safety, that when they feel that those things are being taken care of, sometimes they don't mind taking care of it. And again, I know they don't like being taxed at 70%, but they do feel they're getting value for their corona. So I will only tell you, I've been in these countries before. I do find the people, and I've been to every, one of, these, every one of these top countries. Uh, I've been all the way up here. I haven't been to Kuwait, but I've been to Austria and I've been to Canada. And I've been to, not been to Lithuania, uh, and I haven't been to UAE. But of the top 23, 24, I've been to 25. I've been to all those countries. I would say that that's does not surprise me any of this stuff that surprises me and what i really find uh, uh, amazing again is that is that israel our country too uh -huh. is right up there at the top which tells us again that for all the problems that israel has all the stuff that israel is worried about all the real real fears that they have in israel that's uh -huh. a country where people are actually happy they're happy to be part of that country they're happy to live there and I am definitely concerned with the fact that we're going in the wrong direction in this country that we've dropped. This is, a, this is again, is, as I said, you got to be careful of polls, but this one was not done with a political agenda of, right. of um, making America um, look bad. Um, but again, I, I posted the link. If you want to read more about it, um, this is a real important thing to, uh, to uh, think about. And again, this is something where, um, and at the end of the day, and again, for those who are also fans of Dennis Prager, he does the whole thing about happiness. And um, it is definitely something that uh, while it's difficult, and it says right here, saw the word right here, measuring subjective well-being, right? It's tough to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, we understand that there is at least, at the very least, an understanding that this is important, that people need to take into consideration the fact that happiness, I think, what does Prager say? It's that happiness is a serious matter. He wrote a book called Happiness is a Serious Matter. So uh, that it's important to understand it and to evaluate it and to consider it and to make sure that people are, uh, you know, you know, are at least moving in the right direction. Uh, yeah, here it is. Happiness is a serious matter. Happiness is a serious problem. Here, it's right here. So I'll share is there it also a, a correlation with education? Because our rankings in the United States of our education has been dropping too. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Those countries is dropping and education is dropping. Absolutely. If you look at absolutely, Joyce. If you look, there's definitely got to be a correlation. I'm not I sure. That they actually, I'm not sure that they actually talked about it in. Uh, in this, um, that's a great point. I'll I'll take a well, look. We at are it. talking about it. And I no, think no, I'll, 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 take, I'll, I'll take a look at it because I'm looking at it here. It says talks about social support, a healthy life expectancy, freedom, generosity, and corruption. 
uh, do, do, do factors of smoking, exercise, and diet. I don't see anything in here that talks about education, but here's what I promise you, Joyce. If you look at the countries with the with the highest education uh, rankings, Finland, yes. is, Finland is right there at the top. So I think there is a correlation. Absolutely. Uh, and I think it's a very good point. And I think it's something that, um, you know, again, it doesn't seem like they necessarily found that correlation or 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 looked at those um they don't seem to be talking about it in this but that's the first thing that hit me that was missing in our country out of that whole oh, list israel is, is the only one that's producing any tech it's producing what tech ah, technology right a lot yeah some out of some out of Australia and New Zealand, but um, that's, yeah, uh, we'll we'll uh, anyway, look, that's a discussion I'll, for another time. I'll look, I'll look to see if education was mentioned in any of the other stuff, by the way, in any of these other pages. But um, it is a very interesting. Wait, wait, wait. Did, was Panama above us? Uh, I don't was Panama above us. I don't think so. I think Panama twenty nine. No, okay. No, no, I don't think any. Um, Costa Rica. Costa Rica was. Costa Rica. In no, Southern that's a beautiful place. Kuwait. Yeah. yeah, Kuwait's a good, great place. Sure. Yeah. Costa okay. Rica. Costa Rica is the only Latin American country that was there. But yeah, Costa Rica is a very, very happy country. By the way, too, high levels of education and also very, very low levels of anti Semitism. The Jewish community in Costa Rica is a very, um, well maintained, well, uh, very safe. Jewish and no community. begging, very, no begging very, in the streets. Yep, very, very difficult, different uh, vibe there than all the countries that surround. Yeah, it. interesting to to also have a correlation between, you know, anti uh, Semitic and and you know where yeah. the Jewish communities. Now again, Scandinavian countries just don't have very large Jewish communities. They never right. have. Netherlands would be like the top country on this list would be would would be the country that had had before the war a fairly large Jewish community. But most of these countries just don't have ones. But the ones that are there generally feel very safe and secure. I've talked I've been to the synagogues in Finland, Denmark. There are no synagogue. There is one synagogue in Iceland, but it's very small. Uh, Maybe not Kuwait. We, yeah, Kuwait is the first country you get down right. to where there isn't a Jewish community. But um, but these countries, all in the top ten, yeah. they all have Jewish communities that are very safe and and wow. Cool and and um, yeah, so interesting to think of too. Well, thank yeah. you everybody. Be safe and be secure and feel good this uh, rest of this next couple of weeks. We want to remind people that we have Purim this Saturday night, so this is a time for us to celebrate and to. Uh, contemplate and to, um, I would say, in, in, in definitely at the forefront of our minds this year to celebrate Jewish survival and to uh, sub, to celebrate Jewish resiliency and to remember that our enemies, just like the enemies that we talked about at the uh, time of Purim, are not going to succeed. They're not going to be. They're not going to. Uh, their hatred is is uh, is uh, is based on on. Uh, evil and based on um mm -hmm. based on the, the 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 most vile forms of prejudice and uh and they will be destroyed just like and envy people there so uh this is a year where Purim takes on uh, uh I think a whole different a whole different emphasis but I want to tell you it's um it's uh, tough to think about laughing and celebrating and 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 uh, partying when when uh, there are people being held in, in uh, underground in tunnels and in, in cages right now. But at the same time, uh, we, we will do what they're going to do in Israel. And you'll, you'll see it before we see it. Hopefully you'll see some pictures. I'll post some video of what's going on in Israel for Purim. Pur Purim is a national holiday there. And uh, they're going to be celebrating Purim. And it's going to mean a lot. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a bittersweet time. But I will tell you that it's going to be a. Um, it's 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 very necessary and very uh, relevant for us to think about it this Purim. So seven o'clock on on Saturday night, and uh, take care in the meantime, everybody. Be happy.
Thank be you. Happy. Be happy, happy and pray for Israel. Yep, absolutely. Thanks, everybody. Yes. Bye -bye. Thank, Thank you, Rabbi. Rabbi. Bye, Rabbi. Thanks, Rabbi. Bye, Rabbi. Bye, Rabbi.